We all know that good eating habits are important for our overall health. But did you know what you eat can also have a huge impact on your gut health? Nutrition and gut health go hand in hand. So it's very important to have clean eating habits to keep our gut health in check and to live healthier. Hi, everyone. I'm Tamika Bickham, your host for today's discussion, coming to you live from the Baptist Health Newsroom. March is National Nutrition Month, and we want to encourage people to understand what they're eating, make informed food choices at the grocery store, and develop healthy eating habits. We have with us today two experts from the Baptist Health family to talk about why it's important to maintain good gut health. I'd like to welcome gastroenterologist Dr. Seth Rosen and registered dietitian Carla Duenas from Baptist Health. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Thank, thank you. you. How are you all doing today? Very well, thank you to me. Excellent. Wonderful. So first I want to say before we dive into today's subject, I want to remind our viewers to go ahead and send in your questions and comments throughout the segment. We are here for you and happy to answer any questions you may have. So let's go ahead and dive in. First question is for you, Dr. Rosen. Let's start off with the basics. What are the signs and symptoms of an unhealthy gut? And what are some warning signs that you should see a doctor? You know, the, uh, the biggest thing is if there's a change in the way you feel. Uh, there can be any of a variety of symptoms. It can be bloating, constipation, diarrhea, uh, excessive gas. Um, many of these symptoms are not serious uh, or don't represent a serious health concern. But if there's been a significant change in the way you feel uh, compared to the past years, then you should uh, seek evaluation. And another key issue is a significant change in your appetite or a significant change in your weight. Great tips there. Significant change in your appetite or significant change in your weight. So really staying in tune and in touch with your body, it sounds like there. Um, yeah. Carla, this next question is for you. There are several steps we can take to promote healthy digestion. So talk to us about the key ingredients we can incorporate into our meals that benefits healthy digestion. Of course. So the basics of what would help promote a good digestion is really eating a healthy, balanced meal. And it's not just about what we're eating, but how much as well. If we eat just a big meal, that can lead to just feeling bloated, heavy, even painful from the stomach stretching. And so the, the healthy plate really looks like half of the plate or 50% vegetables, non-starchy vegetables specifically. So green leafy vegetables, tomatoes, mushrooms, peppers, cucumbers, etc. 25% carbohydrates. And this is a key usually when people feel too tired or too bloated after having a whole bowl of pasta, right? Just making that simple switch of reducing the amount of carbohydrates in that plate, not eliminating, but reducing helps with digestion as well. And 25% of the plate protein, which people that tend to have those symptoms too, after eating, experience it after eating a plate that's maybe half of the plate steak or chicken or whatever protein they're eating. It's just too much. 25% is just about right for the average person. And so that really prevents overeating and provides the body with just, like you said, the key ingredients for basic metabolism for energy throughout the day. Um, and now yeah, overall, that's a, the basic of the plate, basically. I love when you describe the plate because I've heard you talk about this before. So keeping that in mind, that 50% vegetables, 25% whole grains, and 25% proteins. That's a good way to, to visualize it and make sure you're having a, a balanced meal. Uh, so great tips there. Dr. Rosen, let's dive a little deeper into good and bad bacteria. What is the gut microbiome and what role does it play in our digestive and our overall health? So there are literally billions of bacteria that live in the GI tract. Uh, some people have estimated that there are more bacteria cells in the GI tract than there are human cells in the body. Um, and they, they provide a, a whole variety of functions. They help with digestion. They provide some nutrients to the body that then subsequently get absorbed. Um, they maintain homeostasis, which is healthy balance in the body. Uh, and when they get out of balance, you can have a, a host of different uh, symptoms. 
uh, some of which again are, are serious, some of which are just annoying, gas, bloating, diarrhea. Uh, there are bad bacteria that you can, uh, that you can have. Um, sometimes you can get an infection from something you've eaten and everybody's had a gastroenteritis. It can be a virus, it can be a bacteria. Um, you can have bacteria that actually live in the GI tract that are kept in check by the good bacteria. If you take antibiotics, you can, uh, you, you can get rid of uh, some of the good bacteria and the bad bacteria can overwhelm the system. And the classic example of that, which uh, has gotten a lot of press in, past, in recent years is uh, Clostridium difficile which causes a very severe, can cause a severe diarrheal illness. Uh, so there is a, a fine-tuned balance of bacteria in the GI tract uh, that's, that's critical for uh, healthy functioning. Great information there. Um, thank you. Now, Carla, we have all heard that saying that food is medicine. I love that saying. So with that being said, what types of food can keep your gut healthy? Um, basically, going back to Dr. Rosen, what we eat feeds that bacteria, specifically the healthy bacteria, or that's what we should be promoting, right? Feeding the healthy bacteria. So there's two categories of food when we think of gut health and what types of foods can feed those bacteria. And typically, people get them confused. So they're called prebiotics and probiotic foods, right? So the best way I can explain it is the prebiotics are food for the probiotics. The probiotics are the live bacteria that like Dr. Rosen mentioned, we have in our guts, but we can also eat them in foods or found in certain foods that are specifically fermented foods. And so to give examples of probiotic foods, the most common one that probably we have all eaten at some point in our lives is yogurt, is fermented milk. So if you're eating any type of yogurt, that is a naturally probiotic food. Other examples are not so common, especially here in America, but kimchi, which is fermented cabbage. We also see sauerkraut, which is fermented cabbage, just different spices. Um, kombucha, which has had, gotten a lot of attention in the last couple of years. I think that's becoming more mainstream. It's fermented black tea. And the last example I can give is tempeh, which is fermented soybeans. And all of these have an acquired taste. And I get that we didn't grow up eating, but I definitely encourage people to give it a try. It takes multiple expo exposures, but as you're eating those foods, you're adding more of those healthy bacteria to your gut, right? So increasing the population of the healthy bacteria. And then on the other side, if you compare those foods or at least eat them also a couple of times a day, the prebiotic foods, which again, those are the food for the bacteria. These are specific types of fiber. So think of plant foods. Fiber is found in all plant foods. And so things like bananas, garlic, asparagus, artichokes. Um, I mean, and going down the list is really all fiber foods. That healthy bacteria loves fiber. So a quick example here, Greek yogurt with banana. You're eating a prebiotic and a probiotic in one sitting. So that's a great way to keep your, your gut health in check. It sounds like there's plenty of options there to help keep our gut health in check that we like, but also some of those that you mentioned have that acquired taste. So I think a wide range for, for those of us to choose from. Uh, Dr. Rosen, this next question is for you. Our immune system is extremely important, and I've heard that a healthy gut and a healthy immune system go hand in hand. So what is the relationship between our gut and our immune system? So the uh, gut has an extensive uh, collection of immune cells, uh, white blood cells. Uh, and the, the GI tract is technically considered outside the body, but it's the entrance into the uh, rest of the body. And the uh, immune cells in the body kind of screen in the, in the GI tract screen what comes through. And they're critical in on several levels. Uh, they help uh, promote immune tolerance so that you don't react to everything that comes through as if it's an infection or a foreign invader. And it also uh, triggers the uh, body, body's appropriate reaction when there is uh, a pathogen, a bad virus or bacteria 
that uh, gets into the GI tract and then could get into the body uh, proper. So the, it has been said that the GI tract has the largest collection of immune cells in the body, and uh, it's kind of its own immune system. So it's critical to the way uh, the body handles uh, both illness and health. And it starts out immediately uh, at the, uh, after you're born, at the time of birth, uh, when suddenly uh, a sterile area has now uh, uh, exposed to a variety of bacteria that you get, and it continues throughout your life. Wow. That is really fascinating and great information, how important our gut is to our overall immune system and our overall health. Carla, I want to ask you about dietary supplements. Dietary supplements have been marketed to promote a healthy gut and have been become popular throughout the years. Are these products good for the gut or are they just a gimmick? It's hard to, it's hard to answer that question simply, but I guess I'll answer it with with the overall reply, which is supplements in the United States are not regulated. So there's no agency overlooking to see exactly what it has or the amount. So that's, I guess, warning number one. Most of them are pretty safe. It's not gonna hurt us. At worst, it's a waste of money, right? So I usually tell people, if you're looking for a long-term healthy habit, don't spend your money on pills, really look into changing habits, incorporating more of those pre and the probiotic foods into your into your day to day. Now, if you, for some reason, have to take an antibiotic, for example, like Dr. Rosen mentioned, they are necessary sometimes if you have, if you have an infection, make that's when for a short period of time, you can supplement, you, you could supplement with, um, with a probiotic. The most common ones, that there are just so many in the market. And I think that's where people get confused. And it all comes down to look at the ingredient list in the back, make sure that one, there's variety in them. You're not just getting one strain, you're getting multiple, not just the number of them, but the type, right? Different families, different strains within that. Um, and then you're going to see that it has at least from like 10 billion, 20 billion up to 50 billion. Um, and, and that if you're, if you're using it as a treatment, it is recommended to go a little bit on the higher end. It, it's just shown to help alleviate some of the symptoms associated with, with antibiotics. So for example, the most common one that we all know is diarrhea. Um, but again, on a day to day, I definitely don't recommend it because it, it, it might not really provide that benefit that we do get from food and food. We get a variety of them and also other nutrients as well. Yeah, uh, echoing what Carla said uh, on, on two two points. Number one, it's not just the number of uh, organisms in a probiotic; it's the type, and different types of probiotics are used in different settings for different purposes. And well, a common question is: Should everybody be on a probiotic? And, and again, as Carla suggested, on a routine basis, most people don't need a separate probiotic uh, on a daily basis. And, it, and it's not clear that it's a wide use of, wise use of your uh, money and resources uh, on a regular basis. So there's no inherent benefit as a general rule, but there are such specific situations where probiotic uh, supplements can be helpful. And remember that all of these, as, as Carl mentioned, they're supplements. They're labeled as supplements. They are not labeled as drugs, and they're not con they're not uh, uh, controlled by the uh, Food and Drug Administration. Some great We're just trusting trusting blindly the companies that it has what it says it has. No, absolutely. And that's such important information. And really what I took away from that is really prioritizing. If you want to make a change, prioritize that healthy eating and what you're actually putting in your body. So I want to say thank you so much, Carla Duenas, Dr. Rosen. This has been an absolutely great conversation. And again, I want to say, remember to our viewers, be sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button on our channel here to keep up with the latest health and wellness information and tips from our experts. You can also connect with us on all of our social media channels. We're everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and also LinkedIn. And check out our resource blog for the latest news at baptisthealth.net slash news. You'll find a link there to all episodes of the Baptist Health Talk podcast as well. On behalf of everyone at Baptist Health, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you for watching.